Talk Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's live coverage here in Atlanta, Georgia for Supercomputing 24, SC24. It's shorthanded down. It's been around since 1980. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, my co-host, also uh, the Cube Pod every Friday. Don't check it out. Uh, this Wednesday. <laughs> this Wednesday, we're pre-recording it, we're on the road. Um, Dave, it's been quite a show, three years watching this evolution. We saw four years ago, all the recruiting was being done here for all the top engineers, machine learning, AI was coming into the scene. HPC was moving the needle inch by inch, and then all of a sudden, game-changing inflection point, and the data's coming in, the infrastructure's uh, leveling up, new software's coming in, architecture's leveling up again. It's an it's a, it's a ongoing advancement, and you know, storage is a big part of it. I called it super storage, super networking, super cloud, super apps. Storage is a big conversation. Let's get into it, Sam Werner, Vice President, Product Manager at IBM. Sam, great to see you. Great to be here. So we were talking before we came on about this, the role of storage, and I think you know, one of the most important things besides power cooling from making racks not melt is storing the data, um, because having that data and the data platforms, that's where all the action is right now, and it's really not just about blob storage or just object store, it's just a bigger picture. Gen AI needs that data in low latency. This has been the top conversation on theCUBE for a year. Um, this is where you guys are. Give us your take on that storage paradigm uh, as this new era unfolds. Yeah, it's, it's a great space to be in right now with everything happening with AI and if you've ever been to, to the supercomputing event, you'll notice it's also a storage show. They're all the big storage vendors are here talking about what they do, and there's a reason for that. You have to be able to store all this data very efficiently. You've got to have low power and cooling costs because you have to make way for all the very power-hungry GPUs required to do AI and supercomputing. So, first of all, you have to have very efficient storage. It has to be super fast because you don't want these GPUs sitting idle. They're very expensive. And then you have to be able to organize massive amounts of data to get any real value out of AI. So there's a lot of challenges that storage has yeah. to address to make this work. Yeah. yeah, and you know, this show we were just talking about, it's, it's GTC, like Sam, you call it the open systems of, of GTC. And the other one's NAB. Yeah. That's another big storage show, isn't it? I mean, it's just lots of, sometimes with all this you know, compute, we get lost in the fact that we're talking about petabytes upon petabytes of data, and it's just yeah. exponentially growing. That's right, I mean, we have customers at exabytes of data and growing, right? And, and with a lot of these new AI models, people want to keep all the data forever, too. So you can trace back how you came to conclusions you did. So that, you even bring in tape storage, which we also provide, and we can give you long-term archival of this data at the absolute lowest possible cost when it comes to energy consumption, because these are just tape cartridges, right? And and, and the extreme economics. I love the soundbite, John, and you've written about this, I have too, as has George. Uh, GPT-4 was trained on half a petabyte of data. JP Morgan supposedly has 150 petabytes of data. So, you know, that's kind of your hybrid IT, hybrid wheelhouse. That's right, that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting is, when you look at, you know, the big AI models that are out there, they've already consumed all the world's data, right? They've, they've trained on everything there is that you can get your hands on. They've come up with really creative ideas to get more data and they even create, you know, data in order to have more to train it with. But then you go look at an enterprise, the large enterprise customers out there, their data's not in any of these models. 1% of their data is in yeah. those models. So how do they bring all of that data to the models to actually get real value for them and for their customers? That's the next big frontier here, right? And what's the challenge on that? Because that's a huge headroom. We've written about it, Dave. You're breaking analysis around comparing um, Jamie Dimon to Sam Altman, you know, and showing that the enterprise opportunity is huge because they're, not, they're going to have their own models. Yep. They have to build their own machines. They have, need to have their own systems. And, and, and we're talking about the classic storage, networking, and compute. Now redesign in a new er, this new era. We're calling it the old chapter is now closed. We're entering in the clustered systems where storage is a big part of it. What is the core problem that you see your customers facing that you guys are solving? How would you describe that? Well, I, I mean, I think everybody knows one of the biggest challenges they have, first of all, is to decide where they're going to do it. Are they going to do it in a cloud or are they going to do it on-prem? I think they find out the cloud is extremely expensive uh, and it actually is probably more economical to build their own. So I see a lot of them looking to build their own. And then they realize their data centers aren't really up to the task, <laughs> right? In a lot of these cases, they don't have 
First of all, you, if you've walked around, you notice a lot of liquid cooling happening okay. in this place, right? Yeah. So Back to the future, Sam. <laughs> Back to it's the a future. hot area, as we yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing water cooling a long time at IBM. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, so they have challenges with power. They have challenges with having a data center that can support water cooling. So they're having to rethink about how they're going to build all this. And I will tell you, the storage piece is extremely important too. You need to get it into a small footprint at the most affordable cost in terms of power, cooling, everything to go with it. Uh, and then organize your data in a way that you can actually bring it for training. Yeah. You know, when you train a model, you have to do checkpoints because GPUs fail and they fail a lot. So you have to constantly do checkpoints. And while you're doing a checkpoint, everything stops. So your training cycle time is elongated if you have long time to write your checkpoints and that's where storage is so critical we're like right in the middle of shortening down the cycles to do training so you know the scale today is a completely new dimension so I wonder if you could talk about how IBM generally IBM storage specifically thinks about scale how you're supporting AI scale I mean everybody yeah. thinks scale they think cloud but now when you start bringing this stuff on, on prem, help us understand, because you may not need you know, the, the giant scale for some of the smaller language models, but at the same time, you may. How are yeah. you guys thinking about that? Well, I, I have a product that's very aptly named for this challenge, which we call IBM Storage Scale, and it dates back to the very beginning of high performance computing. It was the file system for high performance computing. It used to be GPFS, GPFS yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, Yes, GPFS is part of scale, but it's so much more than that. We've been working on it for years and years, and it is the fastest storage solution in the industry for running high-performance computing and now AI. I mean, we just published our benchmarks that we did with NVIDIA, GPU Direct. We're now um, certified with our scale system 6000 for the NVIDIA SuperPods, and we're getting 310 gigabytes a second throughput for reads and 155 on writes, which is by far the fastest in the industry for those benchmarks. But we can start you, to your point on scale, we can start you in a little 2U box. You know, I mean, we're starting now at 500 terabyte range. Very affordable to get started with AI, but this thing can grow, I mean, scale can grow to yottabytes in its file system. Can you talk about how you're doing that, if I may, just yeah. the, the, how you're getting that that level of write performance, you know, what's the caching look like? And yeah. What's the state of the art today for lowering latency? Well, I mean, first of all, scale is extremely, an extremely efficient file system that we've been innovating on for years and years to get down to hardware limitations on performance, right? We have so little overhead in our, in our path. And yes, we use cache and we go up to three terabyte cache in our 6,000. So you can get to extremely high performance. But one of the great things we also allow you to do is we'll put in NVMe drives in the main system to give you super high performance, but then you can put racks and racks of spinning disk behind it so you get super cheap economics, right? Because spinning disk is still, I mean, a fraction of the cost of even QLC drives. Mm -hmm you know, quarter of the price, even less, for spinning disks, so we can do racks of that. We run all the performance through our NVMe drives, and we have the intelligence in it to manage the data onto this back end of spinning disk, and it's extremely parallel, right? It's a parallel file system, so we're able to do all this I.O. in parallel, so you're able to take advantage of all of the I.O. paths you have, right? We take advantage of every lane, you know, we're now in PCIe, Gen 5, and we're able to yeah. completely peg the throughput on the... So it lends itself to AI, John. That's yeah, I mean, this is the, the question. I'm glad you asked that question, because I was going to talk about the multimodal data coming in. Computer vision is massive. Yeah. So they need huge horsepower on that. Storage is critical. Search is a killer app. You're seeing right. retrieval, augmentation generation, or RAG as the entry level, but that's not going away. It's still, I still want to find stuff, and get all that data ingested into vector embeds and, and the format of the neural network. Talk about the performance that you guys are seeing and what you're offering, because I think storage can't be overlooked and it's not overlooked and it's for the critical area for making Gen AI work. Yeah. Computer vision and the search paradigm, because they're coming fast and hard. I mean, I mean the world, vision is the world. Yeah. I mean, you're going to see more camera footage than ever before. You're, uh, you're so spot on and I love this topic right here because the way it all works today is you take all, 
everybody treats storage just as a fast data provider and then we'll make sure you have persistence of that data and don't lose it, right? That's how storage is treated today. So everybody is copying all this data to their AI model. You talked about Rack, people are building these vector databases, they're copying files out of storage onto servers, they're doing all of the vectorization using GPUs, and they end up with like six copies of this data to get to this vector database. And customers we work with have only been able to vectorize like up to 10% of their data, because mm. the vector database gets too big, or they, you know, they have new data coming in and they have to update it, and you can just never get all your data in there, right? So we're changing this paradigm completely. Rather than bringing all your data and building this vector database, what if we did all of that in the storage, put accelerators in the storage products, and actually did the vectorization as data changes? We know when the data changes. Right? So we can actually vectorize it in real time. You got our attention. Sam, Sam. <laughs> First of all, yes, I love this, because look, a lot of people look at RAG as, or retrieval generation, yeah. as an easy thing to do. And it's tri almost trivial to play with it. Right. Scale, you mentioned earlier, you see things at scale you don't see, and you're seeing the winners like AWS, NVIDIA, IBM. When, you, when you're at scale, you can see problems and solve them that no one else can. This is a huge right. point in today's modern era today, right. this post-AI modern era, whatever you want to call it. Talk about the scale piece of it because it's, the search works. You, as you get down the rag road with search retrieval, it breaks because it's not optimized. Right. You're saying you're optimized. Explain that in more detail because I think that's a killer well, feature for where people break right now in their POCs. Yeah. And let me take it like one step farther in how we do, so I'm going to address your question, but there's another capability we have in IBM Storage Scale. So the thing I was talking about, we call it Content Aware Storage or CAST, and that capability we're putting into our products so you can query the storage itself to get the answers rather yeah. than bringing it out and doing it elsewhere. But in order to do that, you have to imagine an enterprise has data all over the place. They have it in maybe an HDFS behind their Hadoop or Spark clusters. Yeah. They have it in object stores, maybe in the cloud yeah. and in their own data center. They have old NAS systems sitting around. I have data everywhere. These files in all my different applications land in different places. It's not practical to say copy everything into one Uber storage pool, right? That's that's a big challenge to an organization. We don't say you need to do that because we have something in scale called active file management. With active file management, so scale has a global namespace. We give you one single namespace you can use everywhere and scale forever, but then we can talk to all of your unstructured data sources using our active file management and cache the data in. And we can keep track of changes across all that storage with CAST. So as the data changes in all these different repositories you have, we'll constantly update within scale and give you this query engine that we call CAST. So at scale, we can do it, you know, high performance in our box, and we can attach to all your data sources. That's how you do it. Are there scale. physical limitations, like distance limitations? You have to do that within it. It's a global system, correct? Yeah, there's, by, there's always the, the performance of distance, sure, but, but because we cache the data in as it's needed. I mean, we have customers who run scale all over the yeah. world and share data with each other, and we act as an accelerator. I, I have a customer, for example, that runs high performance workloads in a public cloud, and they have their data in their data center, and they have the data in the object store. They use our caching capability to run their high performance workload in the public cloud, and it caches data out of their data center yeah. and out of their object storage in the cloud to give them the high performance. And the accelerator that you talked about on the storage, like what is that? Is that an ASIC? Is that your design? No, so uh, that's a great question. So we'll support you know, some of the standard GPUs you see in the industry, but also IBM and IBM Research, we built our own accelerator that we right. call uh, I, well, I don't know what we're calling it these days. Okay. We've, yeah. called it, but it's, we've called it IIUs. It's <laughs> IBM. Which is IP. IBM inferencing uh, yeah. chips. All ah, right, okay. So, yeah, um, and so we have our own accelerators, uh, and, and then we'll also use other industry standards. On your scale example with their search, I want to come back to what the impact is to customers, because again, I appreciate it and I recognize that that's a great position to be in today. People yeah. are in pain, and you got the headroom for the future. Scope the order of magnitude change from a customer experience standpoint, old way versus the new way, because you mentioned what they had to go through with the, with the retrieval piece, you got the scale, I get that. What's it like for them from a deployment standpoint, how they consume to the new way? What's the, it, the customer experience, 
consumption. Well, I mean, I'll say the biggest thing is that this actually works <laughs> compared to the way they're doing it today. I, I know people think they can do it today, and like you already made yeah. this point, at smaller scale, sure, it works the way they're doing it. But when you get to larger scale, you have so many problems of why you can't do it this way. I mentioned the 10%. Yeah. Yeah. The data is always stale because data is constantly changing and you're not able to update your database. I've talked to customers who destroy their vector database every day to start over because they don't know what's changed. So the yeah. only way they to tear do it, it down, it, tear yeah. it down and read. There's no it. resilience. Which and yeah. no, and it, zero. It shoes up a lot of GPU power and cost. Okay, so if, I, if I'm sold on this, you got me yeah. sold. So thank you very much. Now, I'm an, there's two scenarios. I'm an IBM customer, Yeah. so what do I do? What do I have to do to, to take advantage of this? Or two, I'm not an IBM customer. I have a little bit of IBM yeah. storage. What do I do? What do I rip and replace? Do I just install new gear? Is it software? Take me through, I'm trying to figure out the at steady state yeah. uh, customer environment. It is new gear. Uh, the good news is, in my opinion, and I am only slightly biased, <laughs> the best storage in the industry, we bring that in. Like I said, you can start pretty small. I mean, a 500 terabyte box maybe, right? Yeah. You put that in, we'll attach to all your existing storage. You don't have to go rip all your storage out. Yeah. You're just bringing in a great new experience with scale. It'll provide acceleration. It's totally certified with NVIDIA. We're supporting the uh, NVIDIA um, data flows as well as our own Watson X stuff. So we IBM have our own yeah. Watson X platform and we support yeah. you know both of the different data pipelines. NVIDIA or IBM's. What are the key product features for you guys on the roadmap right now you're, they're prioritizing and how do you see your growth strategy um, implementing off that? You talked about scale a lot, you know, and how enterprises, look, everybody's challenged with skills, so we're really focused on making it easier and easier, right? We want to make it, so it's not just about supporting AI, it's putting AI down into our products, right? Automatic recovery, automatically diagnosing problems, telling you what issues need to be addressed without you having to have such a huge number of skills to support it. I mean, Scale has a background in high performance computing where people love to play with it, right? And that's part of the fun of being in HVC. But in this world of AI, where people are using it for enterprise applications, they really want it to be simple and hands off. So we're bringing the AI to the systems. Um, that's a big part of our roadmap. We're always, I mean, we're at supercomputing. We love to talk about performance. We yeah. will continue to lead the way in performance, yeah. improving our IO 500 benchmarks. Yeah, you know, price performance is back in, re, in, in, in fashion. It's always never gone away. So energy is also a big deal. Sustainability, price performance. These are what the top conversations are here at supercomputing. Yeah, and I challenge anybody watching this to go look <laughs> at the kilowatts required to run our scale system 6000 versus the competitors. Look at how much capacity you need to support. The NVIDIA published super pod specs or base pod specs. Look at our energy consumption versus the competition. We're at least half. And, and in a lot of cases, depending on which competitor, even more than that. I mean, like half against our best competitor. <laughs> and that's huge, because I, I said it before, the, big, yeah. the enterprises that are bringing in GPUs, they don't have the energy yeah. for all this stuff, right? Let NVIDIA take up all the energy, we'll give you all your data. Yeah, I mean, every cost. little bit helps, yeah. right? I mean, we know that compute is the big culprit, yeah. but if you're running out of power and you can steal some from storage, or you can improve yeah. your storage efficiency, you know, why not? Right. People forgot about it when we went from spinning disk to flash, yeah. but now <laughs> the systems are so large at scale, it becomes, I don't know what percent it is of the blame pie, but it's, you know, double digits. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we can help yeah. even more yeah. with our tape products. I always have to bring up tape because we did, uh, we designed a, <laughs> a tape library for hyperscalers and, right. and some of the hyperscalers. I know, when I try to get my pictures off of Facebook, it takes a while. But. <laughs> <laughs> we always say tape is dead, long live tape. Yeah, that's uh, right. So final question for you. You know, we've seen this movie before in other ways. Now we're obviously in a new changeover. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, in every performance wave, we've seen the same thing happen around storage specifically. There's been an acceleration layer, there's been an offload. Every time you have a constraint, you optimize around it. You mentioned GPU cycles, that's a big one. Oh yeah. How do you see the architectural evolving as we move forward? The techniques are all there, it's just re-architected in a new modern way. What would you say to someone who's evaluating their Oh, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I'm get, I got wasted CPU cycles, I got to re-architect my clustered system. What's your advice as you look at this new architecture? Well, I mean, I think 
if, if, if this is what I've already been talking about, really. I mean, if you look at what we're doing with content aware storage, I think it's time. We've talked about this a lot of times over the history of storage. I've been around storage a while, <laughs> pushing some of the jobs down into the storage. Right. I think we finally have the killer app for that. And it's this idea of putting the intelligence down in the storage to do the optimization of the data and provide yeah. just what you need. Because you talked about it, I mean, the, the huge amounts of data, the large, especially when you get to the multimodal models, copying all this data, I mean, physically is not possible, yeah. right? It, if you want to architect something the right way, you're going to want to push some of this down, put the, some of the GPUs down in the storage, do some of the work down there, with a lot less data traffic to support it. So you yeah. just didn't have the killer use case previous. I don't think we ever had it until yeah. now. Well, I would say also, that, that first of all, I think that you're right on that too. The other data point I'd share is that on our research, from the Cube Research team, is that the ISV developer market, they're going not up the stack in frameworks, they are starting with the models, but the killer value extraction is closer to the hardware. That's right. For classic though, not, not like machine code developers, the normal chip developers, yeah. the old school classic, Software developer, yeah. they go in low level. So as you push down, are you enabling that up? That's, I guess, that where I see that going. What's your view on that that paradigm of developers getting closer to the action to get great performance, squeeze every inch out of that intelligence? Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of the idea of pushing these data, the data pipeline work down into the actual array where it's really close to the yeah. hardware. And yeah, I mean, the application developers are going to be down at that level, right? And, and where well, Sam, great to have you on the yeah. Cube again. Always. Storage continues to be. Does we, Dave, we've been in the Cube for 15 years. I think the first time we did a Cube segment, we said storage is sexy, and it's <laughs> never not been sexy in terms of its relevance. And now more than ever, Sam, thanks for coming on. Thank the Thank you so thanks, much. Sam. Appreciate it. Great seeing you both. Okay, you're watching the Cube here, the leader in high tech coverage. Check out the Cube Pod every Friday with me and Dave. Thanks for watching. Oh, so.